As was mentioned earlier, brethren, a lot has changed. Let me, let me rephrase that. A lot has been uncovered as to how deep corruption has gotten. This has been a seed planted and grown for many, many years. And um, the, the uh, protests taking place, the riots, but long before that, it started at the top and it's been filtering down. People see, people understand. Those, just like with any organization, whether it be from this podium, anyone speaking, the Worldwide Church of God, the Catholic Church, a government, United States, Europe, France, Germany, corruption starts from the top and works down. And now you can have corruption in lower levels, and the top may know it, it does nothing about it. It's the same thing. It's still from the top down. And Jeremiah told the, the king of Israel, at the time I think it was a vassal king, the king was caving to these all these pagan gods. This was one of the reasons why our creator was taking out Israel. And uh, the prophet Jeremiah told the king, you know, why, why are you doing this? Well, that's what the people want. And he said, that, uh, but you're the king. You're the authority. He has given you that authority. Political correctness, call it what you like. Let's start, brethren. Let's start in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of Elohim and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Elohim may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, furnished unto all good works. They are the last two verses of that chapter. Okay, thank you. These are the last two verses of chapter 3. All of Scripture. So, we're starting out with a reference point here. That no matter where you are in Scripture, in fact, when Timothy wrote this, all they had was the Old Testament. This wasn't even written yet. Paul, these weren't. So they were teaching from the Old all of it, all of it is given by inspiration of Elohim, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction to righteousness. Let's go to the beginning of, of chapter 3 and see if any of this rings a bell. Chapter 3, 2 Timothy Verse 1, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, or money lovers, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, 
They have no natural affection, but they have an unnatural affection. Truce breakers, covenant breakers, truce breakers, they don't stick to their word. Remember what scripture says? Make your words yes, yes, or no, no, or be quiet. False accusers, man, have we seen any of that? False accusers, incontinent, meaning without continence, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of Elohim. And here is another description. Having a form of godliness, a form of righteousness, but denying the power thereof. Having a form of godliness or righteousness, but denying the power of where righteousness comes from or the standard for such a thing. From such turn away. For of this sort, they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women or silly men, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Ever learning, another very important thing, ever learning, oh, I don't understand, I don't understand. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why is someone always learning and never coming to the knowledge of the subject? They don't want to. Because the ultimate understanding is going to fly in the face of what they want to do. Case in point, Jeremiah, Israel, when they were in captivity, he was prophesying to them what our Creator said. They got sick to death of hearing it. They said, Jeremiah, tell us something that we want to hear. Tell us some, some good stuff. That's why they never come to the understanding or the knowledge of the truth, because they don't like what it says. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jamborees withstood Moses, okay, we can go back and check Janus and Jamborees with Moses, okay. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. I wanted you to remember this, brethren. Let's turn to 2 Peter. And I'm getting to a point here. 2 Peter, chapter 2. Let's pick it up in... Um, Let's pick it up in verse 1. But there, were, but there were false prophets also among the people. This is 2 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Even as there shall be false teachers among you. So, if you want to know what the future is going to be, in the first verses right here, you look to the past. It, all you got to look at is at the tenses of these words. But there were false prophets also among the people, were, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily or secretly shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the master that brought them and bring upon themselves with destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken by way could be the individual who's speaking it, or it could be the adversary, of course, he is the animator of all evil. And through covetousness shall they be, shall they with fringed words or deceptive words exploit 
or make merchandise of you. Okay? These are smooth talkers. They do not teach the truth. They skirt around it, but they know how to handle human psychology, and they know how to handle the words. And they can deceive an individual, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be spoken evil of. And, and through covetousness shall they, or they covetousness, they want the money and the power. With fringed words or deceptive words exploit you, whose judgment now for a, of a long time lingereth, okay, or destruction, uh, lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if Elohim spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, or I think the, the word there is uh, Troas, which is a place extremely deep, dark, and chained, okay, and delivered them unto chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spare not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Brethren, we just had a court ruling, a Supreme Court ruling in this nation that said every organization that hires anyone, meaning any organization, you have to hire homosexuals. Bottom line, whether you're a church or others, no exceptions. Apparently, they did not take the example from Sodom and Gomorrah. It's right there. New Testament. This isn't, this isn't old. This is new. And delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversations of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, seeing what they did, and hearing what they did, and hearing their talk, uh, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Yah knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now, he makes distinction? Yes, he makes distinction. Um, everybody is not the same when it comes to righteousness and sin. It, he is the same. He offers forgiveness to everyone, but not everyone accepts. So therefore, he doesn't reward those who do evil like he does those who keep his commandments and obey him. Verse 10, But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise government. Despise government. Well, do we see any of that? Starting from the top, despising government. We have how many cities and states? Well, we've got New York, Pennsylvania. We've got Minnesota. We've got Wisconsin. We've got New Jersey. We've got Washington State and California. Okay. What have they done? Okay. Talk about despising government. All right. Set the place on fire. Uh, in which state was it? In... Um, that took over 10, 10 or 11 blocks of the city? Uh, Seattle, Seattle. Seattle, Washington. Okay, they took it over. Now, we're talking about despising government. Why, is, why does Peter talk about despising government? Well, that's just government. No, 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 no. Where do they get the authority from? From our creator. You despise the government, you despise him. So what do they do? They set the place on fire, burn, Shooting, police officers getting stabbed in the neck and the chest, getting shot, and these people are going scot-free, scot-free. Nothing's happening. It's interesting. But Verse 10, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh 
in the lust of uncleanliness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed are they. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. They'll take down every monument that they don't think should be up, but not one of them people, I believe not one of these people would go the distance that those people who those monuments were honored would be able to do it. Which one of those people would be able to do what George Washington did? Or they were trying to take down the, uh, who was the second president of the United States? Um, Thomas Jefferson, trying to take down him. These men were men of honor. These were strong men. These were moral men. Now, he's, Peter goes on to explain these people that set the place on fire have no regard for authority at all. And by the way, brethren, this is something we should never be a part of and or encouraging because we become like them. Whereas angels, which are greater in power than these people who are presumptuous and despisers of government, greater in power and might bring not railing accusations against them before our, our master. But these, but these people who do these things, as natural brute beasts, they are natural brute beasts made. This is the word that Peter used. I looked it up. Made to be taken and destroyed. Speak, e speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. That's what the scripture says about this sort of thing. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are. Here's another one. And this is sobering. Spots they are and blemishes uh, sporting themselves with their own de uh, own de uh, decisive, uh, decisive, decisivings? Deceiving. Deceiving, I'm sorry. Deceivings while they feast with you. That is interesting. Let me read it again. Let me start in verse 12. These, but these people who do these things, okay, they are presumptuous, they hate government, they destroy things or self-willed. These are natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of things that they, they, they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Now, some of your Bibles may say revel. Okay, revel in a modern vernacular, does not fit the description of the Greek word meaning riot, reveling or raising H-E-double-L -L in, in the daytime, rioting in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin, beguiling beguiling unstable souls beguiling unstable souls and you look that up people that aren't stable and heart they are and they have a heart that they have exercised with covetous practices they are cursed children and that's interesting they have a heart that they themselves exercise. They work their heart to covetous practices. It's like working the muscles of your body, which have forsaken the right way. Apparently, when that looking at this sentence, which have forsaken the right way, they knew the right way. They have forsaken the right way and are going astray following the way of Balaam, the son of 
both sore, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, but through a dumb donkey, okay, speaking with man's voices, forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. Very interesting part coming up. Through much wantonness or much emptiness. That word wantonness is better translated emptiness, okay? Or licentiousness also. Those who are clean escaped, or that word clean has just escaped or is coming out of all this, they lure them right back in from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage. For if they... For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the master, Yahshua, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Brethren, it sounds like what we see on the television or in the news. It's everywhere. And Peter talks about it. He talks about it almost 2,000 years ago. Nothing has changed. But it's interesting. He was going to the past. He says, it's happening here, and it's going to happen to you guys. Be aware. Be aware. They feast among you. All right, let's turn to Psalms. Let's go to Psalms 34. Psalms 34. Now, some of you may remember some of this. I gave this talk on Pentecost, but I'm expanding it. I'm going to pick up Psalms in verse 1. Yeah, I hate to leave out anything out of this uh, because there's so much meat here. The title of this psalm, which was given by the, uh, the, this particular, uh, the one who set up this Bible, he calls it, Seek Yah, seek the, seek the Lord. I will bless Yah at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. Now, this is a contrast to what we just read or to what we're seeing in the news. Bless Yah at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boasts in the Master, in Yahweh. The humble shall therefore, shall hear therefore, and be glad. O magnify Yah with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought Yah, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked into him, they looked unto him, and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. The poor man cried, and Yah heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of Yah encampeth around them that fear him, and delivereth them. Now, what is what? What does that mean? The angel of Yah, angels, the angel of Yahweh encampeth around them that fear him, and delivereth them. Well, now, brethren, we can turn to two kings. Let's put our fingers here. Okay, two kings. If you want to get an idea of what this means, chapter 6 and verse 17. Let's pick it up in verse Pick it up in verse 15. Now, this is a, 
expository, if you will, or an expounding upon what we just read here in Psalms. Pick it up in 15. And when the servant of, of the man of Elohim, this is the servant of Elisha, was uh, risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Elisha, Alas, my master, how shall we do? How are we going to get out of this mess? And he answered, Fear not. Elisha answered his servant, said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. But this guy, this, this uh, Elisha's servant, uh, is, did not see them. And Elisha, verse 17, prayed and said to Yah, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see, because Elisha already saw what his servant is about to see. And Yah opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto Yah and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. And he, going back to Psalm 34, verse 7, The angel of Yah encampeth around them that fear him and deliver him. So who's going to move in? We'll be seeing more about this later on. O oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good, blesses the man that trusts in him. O oh, fear Yah, ye his saints, for there is, there is no want to them that fear him. The young lion, they do lack, and they suffer hunger. But they that seek Yah shall not want any good thing. Come ye children, hearken unto me, I will teach you to fear Yah. What man is he that desireth life? What man that desireth life, and loveth many days, that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil, and thy lips from speaking guile or deceit. Depart from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. Does this fly in the face of anything we see today? Depart from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it? Uh, ask the people who own the businesses in those cities. The eyes of Yah are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The eyes of Yah are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of Yah is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and Yah heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Now he's not saying they're not going to have troubles, or else there will be no reason for delivering. Continuing on in verse 18, Yah is nigh, is close unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit, or a crushed spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Well, our Redeemer said that, that they hated you. If they hate you, they hated me. They put him on a stake. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but Yah delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate righteousness shall be desolate. Yah redeemeth the soul of his servants and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. All right, let's turn to the book of Romans, and I will, I will uh, finish up in this book. Romans chapter 8. I'm going, to, I'm going to pick it up in verse 18, brethren. The title of this section of verse 8, 
Of course, it's, that's not in the not in this in the manuscript, but it's just titled by the author of this particular um, this particular Bible. It's called "The Spirit Assures Us of Future Glory." Paul is writing to the Romans, saying, "For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectations of the creature." or creation, better rendered, the earnest expectations of creation waiteth for the manifestations of the sons of Elohim. For the creation was made subject to vanity or futility, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected them in hope, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of Elohim. So what is that saying? Because the creation itself shall be delivered from bondage of corruption into, into the glorious liberty of the children of Elohim. Do we get that? For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Anybody here think about that? You get into the 50s and the 60s. Yeah, we, we think about that. But not just the growing old part, brethren. It's like with Lot. He was vexed on a daily basis by the things he saw and what he heard by these people, by what's going on, the evil. And no one in authority, and they have the authority from our Creator, is doing anything about it. There's a few that are trying. But for the most part, slash and burn. Just let them go. They're having a good time. For we are, verse 24, for we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he hope for it? But if we hope for that, for that we not, for which we do not see, then do we with patience wait for it. Now, verse 26, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit, what Spirit? The Spirit of our Creator also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we should, or as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts, he, that Spirit that searches the hearts, knoweth what the mind of the Spirit, or our Creator, be, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of Elohim. And we know that all things... Now, if you, if you look at this carefully, and you look at what Paul is going to be saying here, brethren, everything has been done for us. Everything. And how, how, how do we get into that position? It's absolutely amazing. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is, what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of Elohim. And we know that all things work together for good to them. All things work for good, work together for, the, for good to them that love Elohim, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, if you, as we continue on, you'll see what this purpose is and just how much this road's been paved. For whom he did foreknow, now we looked up the word foreknow, knew ahead of time. Knew ahead of time of what? He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. He predestinated. That he might be the first firstborn among many brethren. Oh boy. Moreover, now Paul continues on. So 
For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine. Okay? Now he's causing, we read in the, in the previous verse, that he causes all things to work for the benefit of those that love him and are called to his purpose. And you go back a couple more verses, we don't even know how to pray. So his spirit intercedes for us because the spirit knows the mind of our creator and his spirit intercedes for us uh, and, and, uh, and makes it clear, or if I will, communicates to our creator what we need, what we are. We don't even know how to ask. So for who he did foreknow, he also predestined. So he's talking about the same people. To be conformed to the image of his son. To the image of his son. It's eternal. That he, his son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's one of the big reasons here, brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Remember what the Messiah said? No one can come to the Father except through me. But no one can come to me lest the Father call them. It's a closed loop. You can't get in. You can't buy your way in. You're, you're in. You're predestined. You're called. It's invitation. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. You know what that word justified means? You're not guilty. You're not guilty. He already knows. He already knows us. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. That's amazing. We go all the way back to likewise, we don't even know how to pray. And then he sends the Spirit to search the hearts. Our his knows he knows the heart of our Father. He searches our hearts. So that when we pray, we can communicate properly and get across what we need. How do we, do you ever, do you ever talk to, say, someone, you're, you, you're a girl you're in love with or someone you really have feelings for, and the words get in the way? I mean, there's been songs written about this. And all the words got in the, in the way. I don't know how to tell you I love you. I, I, you know, I'm stumbling over my words. I feel like a fool. Sometimes I felt like an FM radio. I'm just talking on. I think I'm talking over this person's head or to the wall. But here the Spirit is interceding for us to our Creator. And he that searches the hearts knoweth the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of Elohim. And we know that all things work. So here we are. It's all in succession. Work together for the good of them that love and are called to his purpose, and whom he did foreknow. He foreknew these people. He foreknew, he foreknew us, brethren. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he justified. You're not guilty. He gave his Son. We're not guilty. That's paid for. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Glorified. I mean, how much glory can a person get in this life when you've been given an invitation to eternal life to sit with our Redeemer? And all the creation is given unto the sons of Elohim. Can you imagine what that glory is going to be like? What shall we, Paul goes on in verse 31, what shall we say then to these things? If Elohim be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son. So you're, you're looking at someone that gave his own son he loved dearly so that he could intercede for us in prayers. He could search our hearts and souls and our minds. And he, uh, such that he causes everything to work for the benefit of us. He, f he made it a point to foreknow us. And the reason why he probably gave his son, one of the reasons is he knew who we were. Or we're going to be thousands of years ago. And he said we're not guilty. We're justified. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not with him 
also freely give us all things. Well, that going right back to the manifestations, all of creations waiting for the manifestations of sons of men is kind of repeated right here in 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with, uh, not, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of Elohim's elect? It is Elohim that justifies. Any brethren here, we remember being in the hand of our Creator who can snatch you out? You know what that reminds me of? One of the Dirty Harry movies. You know, and uh, it's almost like a, I look at that, that verse and that, the, that phrase as a challenge. You're in my hand. You're in the hand of the Creator of the universe. Who can, who can condemn? Okay. Who can snatch you out of my hand? Step forward. Give me your best shot. You better make it good. You ain't going to make it. Like how Dirty Harry said, make my day, punk. We're, we're in his hand. We cannot be snatched out. Who is he that condemneth? Is it Messiah? Is it, is it, it is Messiah that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of Elohim, who also maketh, again, going back to verse 26 and 27, makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of the Messiah? Shall tribulation? He's not saying that's going to happen, but what, what could possibly do this? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, peril, or sword, what did he say? Our creator says his eye is on those. And he makes sure that they have everything. Even the lion goes without food, but not his. Not his. As it is written, for, the, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present or things to come nor height nor death nor other nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Elohim which is in Messiah our master. What a contrast brethren. What a contrast to burning cities, shootings, killings and we're right in the midst of all of this. We're right in the midst of all this, and we're watching this. Much, I, I, I envision it much like Lot. We're watching all this stuff. Supreme Court hands down, you got to hire the homosexual. Well, what would the Worldwide Church of God do? What are any of these other churches that have 501c3s? They hire people. How about you have, like the Boy Scouts? We... Uh, we were looking on the television the other day, and it's rare that we ever have a television. This is the first time I've had the television on probably in six months. Because the television to me is a disgrace. But anyway, except for maybe watching a video or Tom Curry or something like that. I'm talking about network television or cabled in or whatever, piped in, whatever. If they had the if they had the ad on there once, they had it on there six times. Okay. The first time I saw it, I was reading. I was reading it because I had it muted. I, I don't like advertisements. So the second time I came on, I had the I turned I, I removed the disabled the mute. The Boy Scouts are going bankrupt. The Boy Scouts, the Boy Scouts, okay. And the the there, there's about a half a dozen different lawyer corp, uh, companies or or uh, that are that are. Uh, going after the Boy Scouts. If you or someone you know has been um, abused in the Boy Scouts, now abused, sodomized, raped, whatever, or if it was a girl, call us. You have a narrow window of time. 
Okay, once the bankruptcy comes to a closure, that's it. This is the Boy Scouts. This is the Boy Scouts. We're, we're living. Some of us may have even been in the Boy Scouts. We're living in this, and we're seeing it. But brethren, we're looking at this from a distance. Remember who's around us. Why are we here? Brethren, we have a tremendous amount to be thankful for. And uh, I just want to go into Deuteronomy chapter 32. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Okay. Anyway, um, I did not highlight the section that I wanted to read, but you can go back in and read it. You can pull it right up on your concordance or pull it up on on your uh, on your phone. Is it thirty nine, honey? All right, Deuteronomy thirty two, verse thirty nine. See how that I, even I, am he, and there is no Elohim with me. I kill, I make alive, I wound, I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Weren't we just talking about that, getting snatched out of his hand? For I lift up my hand to heaven, and I say, I live forever. Here's the next one, verse 41. It's very interesting. And it's in, the, the, the verse starts out with an if. If. If I sharpen or wet, with like a whetstone, sharpen my glittering sword and my hand, and if my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and will reward them that hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginnings of the revenges upon my enemy. Rejoice, all ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and his people there's another footnote there as you give Romans 15 but I thought that was interesting for if I sharpen my glittering sword and I put lay my hand on judgment I will render vengeance it is coming it is coming so what we see happening I just I, I just happened to see a couple days ago that the higher appellate court, the appeals court, any, anyone here know, first off, know who Judge Sullivan is? He heard the Flynn case, okay? He's the one that uh, asked the prosecutors, the prosecutors before William Barr, the earlier prosecutors, do we want to prosecute him for, tre for high treasons, which was a death penalty, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, 33 years. He served our military. Judge Sullivan lectured him for an hour on what a horrible person he was. Thought maybe he should receive the death penalty. But Sullivan would have signed it. And uh, the prosecution said, no, no, we, we, we don't want to do that. So th there he is. He went right along with the prosecution. So now enter uh, Attorney General William Barr. He, he investigated all this stuff. All, he investigated the Russia probe. He investigated the call with Ukraine. 
on all this stuff, the, the, the Clinton Foundation and the, uh, all these here documents, fake documents, it's, it's all coming out. So we found out that, you know, you guys railroaded this guy. Okay, you threatened, the FBI threatened. He told Flynn, if you don't sign here, your son's next. We'll take him on. So, as a military man, he fell on the sword. All right. Now, now we find out that the um, Department of Justice dropped the charges. They're fake charges. We, you can't prosecute a man on this. Drop the charges. The judge, who's not allowed to prosecute, said no. No. The judge hires in retired uh, judges to help him prosecute this man, which is completely unconstitutional. Now, this is corruption. This is the corruption I'm talking about. It's amongst us. It's in our nation. So finally, Flynn's lawyer appealed to the court to over and over Sullivan's head. And the court, three to two, one liberal judge, two conservative judges, said, no, no, Mr. Sullivan, you can't do that. You're outside the Constitution. You are in error. This man, you cannot prosecute this man. That only comes from the Department of Justice, not from you. So they handed him down an order, vacate the, vacate the case. Now, he, if he doesn't, then he's going to be held in contempt. So, but this is what I'm talking about. And, uh, and rightfully so, it, it, a, couple of, a couple of the commentators, news commentators said, look, if they can, if the FBI can take this man to the cleaners, this high, he's a high profile man, and trash him, he lost his house. He's got, he had almost a million dollars in lawyer's fees. And this judge wanted to give him a death penalty because he called him a, a treason, a treasonous individual, only to find out that the FBI made a fool of this judge. Either that or this judge was in cahoots with the FBI, one or the other. Doesn't want to let him go. Brethren, we're not a part of that. We just read what our creator has in store for us. So like, like Lot, do we get vexed with these things? Uh, sometimes I, I, I hear these things, and I think, oh, how can this be? But it is. Justice. I look to the seat of justice and what was seen. Wormwood. Bitterness. There is no justice. But our creator knows. Our creator knows. And he said, uh, don't worry about these things. A thousand on one side, 10,000 on your right. You will see what's going to happen to the wicked, but not a hair on your head will be hurt. So um, what price would you pay for that? It's, it's a free gift. We've been invited. We are part of his family. Thank you.